Welcome, everybody, to what might quite possibly be the very first episode of the Game Podcast. The, the, what do you mean, quite possibly? This is the first episode. This is uh, episode one, Uno. I don't know any other words and uh, any other ones in any other languages, but this is the first podcast. Uh, we'll consider it episode zero. This is the pilot episode, so technically it is episode zero. Okay, technically you're correct, so there we go. But anyway, uh, so for those who don't know, which you probably all don't know because this is the first time you're probably hearing us right now, um, the Game Podcast, short for Games, Anime, Movies, and Entertainment, uh, is a podcast where we talk about exactly what the, what the title says. Games, movies, games, animes, movies, and entertainment. Wow, it's almost like we don't have a promo for this that tells them exactly what this show's about. I don't know if they watched the promo, but I point... assume they did. Well, I'm assuming they didn't. The point is, uh, just uh, each time we have a uh, have our podcast, we're going to talk about a multitude of different topics uh, regarding movies, animes, games, entertainment. The way you say anime is just, it's anime. Anime, okay, anime. Anime. Who says animes? The memesters. The uneducated. The animu, they are called that. Oh, it's the gosh, proper, that's this is a, It's the proper plural word for uh, anime, it's animu. Uh, but anyway, so for today's episode, um, today's inaugural episode, we have a few things lined up. Um, the first thing we're going to be talking about is uh, the new Doom DLC, Doom Eternal DLC, the uh, the Ancient Gods Part One. And my gosh! Before we start that, first off, so just so we're clear, that voice over there, the the the, the happy one, that's Josh. This voice right here, the depressive one, that's Nick. <laughs> the one that sounds like he wants to end himself. Yeah, oh, sorry, we probably can't keep that. <laughs> well, we'll see if we can keep that in. No, here. wait, no, this is a podcast. We can say whatever we want. Well, there are limits, <laughs> probably, <laughs> but you know. But um, yeah, so the Ancient Gods Part One. Oh my goodness, that is one of the hardest. Not even DLCs. That's one of the hardest games I have ever played. I didn't die that much in the entirety of the Doom main campaign. And I only played Ancient Gods on Ultra Violence. I didn't even do Nightmare. So for some, just a quick information, for those who don't know, the Ancient Gods um, DLC for Doom Eternal, it came out, what? When did it come out? Like two weeks ago. Really? Yeah, two weeks. Huh. Or two, three weeks, something like that. Um, but yeah, it's um, it's a it's a the DLC it's the newest DLC for Doom Eternal, and um, it is as Nick may have told you, um, it is a it, it, they spare no what's the saying spare no quarter, um, they just drop you in and say okay you know what you know what this game is you've been through it here you go we, they they literally start you out with all the weapons. All the uh, all the mods, all the upgrades you get, you uh, you should have by the end of the original game. And, and everything's maxed out. Yeah, and ev- everything's maxed out, and they just drop you in and just toss everything. Yeah, at no, you at once. Th- this, like the Atlant- the UAC Atlantica facility. Personally, th- it's my favorite level. That's the first level of the entire thing. If I had to put it down, it's not hard. Especially if you're like me and you replayed the entire campaign before jumping back into uh, the jumping into the DLC, it's not hard. But I would say the worst part about it is just the sheer amount of shield soldiers. And I think I'll put a nice yes. little picture up for you. Like I understand the point of why See, these the, nightmarish things are here. It's so you can blow them up and get free points. Hold on, hold on. There's something I noticed. The DLC, it's almost as if they forced you to use the the mods and the guns. You probably didn't use a lot in the actual game. The, the scope. Game. You, like, the scope for, um, the, assault for the assault rifle, um, you have and to use to destroy the turrets, um, the, the eyeball turrets, and something else I can't remember. Um, but they, yeah, they add, they force you to use the oh, scope the a lot. Oh, the blood angels. Oh yeah, the blood angels too. Um, they use they force you to use the scope a lot, and they also force you to use the microwave beam 
um, on the plasma rifle, which, which is admittedly probably the one of the least useful. No, no, no I game. will say. Now, uh, our little brother is a, like, I hate to say it, but he is a pro dude player. That, yeah, that boy knows how to play. Also, in case it wasn't clear, um, uh, us co hosts are brothers, and we have a younger brother. Uh, who also plays Doom, and he plays. See, me and Nick, we play on uh, we play on console, um, and you know, I like to say I'm moderately okay at playing playing Doom. On <laughs> That's a lie. Excuse me. I'm moderately okay at playing Doom on console, but the thing is, uh, there are s admittedly some limitations to playing on Doom, playing Doom on console, because most of all, being the weapon grip wheel. As useful as it is, and it's the probably the best way they could have um, put all the different weapons and give you given you the ability to switch weapons within the game. Um, you know, admittedly, it slows down the game to a certain degree. But meanwhile, when you play on these uh, on PC, you don't have to use the weapon wheel. You can just press a number key and it'll immediately switch to that um, weapon, and you don't even have to worry about slowing the game down or anything like that. Yes, welcome to PC vs. Console. You just explained the console wars for the last 20 years. Well, for those who don't know and who, you know, play, uh, who only play console or only play, play PC or don't play at all, I thought I'd give quick information. The point is, um, yeah, the thing is, our, our younger brother, so he plays Doom on PC and, uh, admittedly... He's a beast. He's not bad at the game. He's a beast. He's not bad at the game. Uh, and he's, um... But even he said... Like the like, I watched his live stream the other day, and he he oh okay so so then let me let me explain. after you get past the UAC facility, you have the blood you swamps. go to the blood swamps. Now the blood swamps, the big challenge of that is there are three big arenas, one on each side of the map, and then the middle one where you have to fight giant eyeball creatures. Um, now the biggest thing is the arenas on the two sides are so hard. I died, I don't know how many times on those, but even, and here's the thing, saying that my little brother is a pro Doom player, even he said that is some of the hardest gameplay he has ever had to do because it was, it, you just had to laser focus in on it. And it was so Hard, Cause they throw everything at you. Yeah, let they me tell you. Let me tell you. Do not play this DLC. Honest warning. Do not play this DLC if you haven't finished the original campaign. You will need the experience because, like I said, the moment you went to this DLC, they just throw everything at you. The game, the DLC goes off the knowledge of thinking that you have played the original game and you know what you're doing and you, you know how this game works. You know the weak points of all the enemies, you know what weapons do, uh, what weapons work best against what enemies, you should know how each of the mods work, how the upgrades help you and all that stuff. Because this, I honestly, like, <laughs> call me stubborn, but there are times that I just kept dying over and over and over and over again. And you know, you die so many times, you, yeah. get, you get offered the <laughs> Sentinel armor, um, which basically reduces how much damage you take with the game. Um, and the thing is, I ain't no wimp. I ain't taking the cheap way out. I ain't saying, that, like, they, sure, they do it, you know, to make the game easier and say, like, hey, look, you've died a lot. Um, we're gonna give you this as a as a as a gift as a boon to try to help you finish the game. And the way I see it is, that's that's the weak way. That's same saying like, oh, you're so you're so bad at the game that we have to give you a a a, a cheat to try to win it. And no, I'm not doing that. But needless to say, I saw that screen a lot, and they offered me a central armor a lot because I died. Well, 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 your boy Josh ain't no wimp. I wanted to finish the DLC, so I took that Sentinel over. <laughs> like, against, uh, what's his name? Uh, Samuel Hayden. We, I, I, I had to use the Sentinel armor because it got to a point where, it, it wasn't the fact that I kept dying. It was the fact that 
I kept getting stuck in a loop against the pain elemental and the dread knight at the end. And I, there'll probably be some type of picture up or video up at this point. <laughs> let me let me tell you, I nearly wait, wait, wait. shed a tear trying. Like I didn't, I I died a lot in that battle, but I didn't die nearly as much as the final area where I had to <laughs> kill the dumb pain elemental and dread knight. I see, died so many times. See, no, no, see, what I got stuck on was I could even keep dying. I got stuck in a loop. Where I would kill the pain elemental, and then the dread knight would keep hunting me, and then a new pain elemental would spawn, and then I kept running out of plasma rifle rounds, and it sucked. But no, see, what I did was I decided, wait, why am I killing the slower enemy first, and that slower is the slower is relative. Yeah, because when they, when they have the spirit in them... Uh, yeah. Hold on, side tangent real quick. Let's talk about the spirit real quick. Let me tell you, that is probably the worst enemy they could have added to the game. I can't stand the spirit. I hate the spirit. I really do. Because... Like, alright, so... A possessed baron, which you will come across within the game. Sorry for spoiling it. But let's be honest, I think anyone who saw the game and knows what the enemies are probably expects it at some point. But yes, it's a possessed baron. You come across a possessed baron at some point. And, um, I used almost the entirety of my Unmaker ammo just to kill that thing. Keep in mind, the Unmaker is the second strongest weapon in the game, next to the BFG. And it took nearly all the ammo I had for that gun to, no, no, to kill it. Let me explain this real quick. So, so, dude, you, you, you think you had it hard. No. I shot this thing with three BFG rounds, I and it, it died, and I was like, yes, you're done, and you you're to dead. And you forgot the spirit, didn't you? I didn't have any plasma rifle ammo. It went into another barret. Oh, yeah. Um, now, now, I'm gonna, now, very, now, this is the quickly. point where there, where there was a tiny little bit of crying, <laughs> where I, I was just like, yes, 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 you can do this, you can do and you saw it. You, you saw it, and I'm like that. Just, just one tear just streamed down your face yeah. as you saw it happen. When that the spirit jumped into the other baron, and I saw I had no plasma ammo, I, I, I was done. I literally set the game down. I was like, I will come back to this tomorrow. I'm gonna go get myself some subway. I'm gonna go to bed because <laughs> I don't want to deal with this again. Yeah, the the spirits, I tell you, are, uh, you know, if I had to give a rating, and I think AG, IGN would give a review for um, the DLC, uh, for, I think it came out like yesterday, I think. Yeah, I think they did. Um, I didn't watch it, though. I didn't. I didn't, but my brother did, and he, like, live streamed it. Um, oh, yeah, he did live stream yeah. it. He and did live stream it. They summed it up pretty well, I'd like to think. Um... The way they put it is, if you wanted Doom, and even more and harder Doom, then this you DLC do. is it. But with the exception of two enemies that are more of a nuisance than anything else, than anything else, being the uh, the Eyeball of Turns and the Spirits, um, the the DLC is good. And let me tell you, I honestly, I, I actually like really agree with them when they said uh, two enemies that are more of a nuisance than anything else. Because honestly. I really don't like the, the, the spirits. They are really I, annoying. I mean, here's my thing. If I'm ranking every level, giving it like a, a 1 to 10 rating, uh, the UAC Atlantica, uh, I'd give it a 9. It's a pretty good level. It's my favorite level. Um, blood Swamps, 4 out of 10. I hate the Blood Swamps. It's the longest level. I, I will never play that level again. Ever in my life. Well, I think what makes that level really hard is it's also so long. Like I said, yeah, I think that's what makes it the uh, the so bad is because it's so long. Like, yeah, but I think it's the longest level. In that the is the game. only level, not in, just the DLC. I mean, just the campaign as yeah, well. That's the only level in Doom Eternal that it actually took me two days, like two separate sessions to finish. Yeah, I had to stop too. Um, and then halt. Halt wasn't too bad. I give Halt... It got worse as it went An on. 8 out of 10. Simply because at no point did they make it so that... Like in the Blood Swans, which is an unending assault of enemies. 
Um, I think Hull did what the Blood Swamps didn't, and it gave a very good large battle arenas, minus the bridge. If you know the bridge, you know what I'm talking about. With the Cyber Demon. Oh yeah. Actually, that wasn't too bad. Well, I guess I had two. I had like three extra lives at that point. So. I had zero, so yeah, it was it, it, it was not a good time to be a Nick at that time. <laughs> well, I mean, what I what I also like about the DLC too is they throw a lot of things into the game that help mix it up a lot. Um, a lot of times, this really makes it annoying because uh, one of my one of my biggest examples of this is in the Blood Swamps. Um, there's this area in the Blood Swamps where you come across this really foggy area. Oh um, gosh, the Arachnitron. And the thing is, there's a there's a possessed Arachnitron, and for anyone who hated Arachnitrons regularly, let me tell you, possessed Arachnitrons suck even yeah, more. Yeah, they are bad. <laughs> um, but uh, in that area, like also in the Blood Swamps, you have these little like gas mines. If you get too close, they'll let out like this proximity area of like, gas that if you get hit. If you walk into that area, you'll um, you'll start taking damage. Um, but they have a whole bunch of that of those in that area. You have like a possessed Arachnitron and a whole bunch of shield um, possessed soldiers start spawning in as well. Yeah, those shield ones were the savior of that area because I literally really? got I I got the Arachnitron in between like three of the shield guys, and then I used the microwave beam to just blow up their shields. And it just took out the Arachnitron, and then I just pounded it with a, uh, what do you call it, BFG shot. And it was done, it's gone. Oh, interesting, I found out. If the spirit doesn't have any enemies to possess, it would just simply disappear. Hmm. That, that was something wonder, I found interesting. I never really wanted to take a chance of letting that happen, so I just ended up killing it. <laughs> so, um, but that's like, that, that was probably one of the hardest areas of the game, at least for me personally, because one, you can't see much because again, it's like really foggy in that area and like you might back yourself up into like a whole group of shield enemies, not knowing they're there because you can barely see like three feet in front of you. And then you have the Ragnatron chasing you everywhere and um, yeah, it's not fun. Um, but it was a nice mix up. I thought it was, as annoying as it was, I thought it was a good way to mix it up. And you know, mix up the combat, throw in some different things into the game, um, which was interesting. Well, the DLC in total, I mean, I, I give it like eight out of ten. I think again, my only issue is that the Blood Swamps is such a long level. The, the DLC is only three levels, but I feel like the UAC Atlantic is very well paced. Halt, very well paced. Blood swamps, yeah, it kind of chugs on. It, it chugs and it brings down the pacing because it's not because like once you finish the first arena, whether you go left or right, you're just kind of like, oh gosh, I have another one to do. I barely survived that one. I mean, to be honest, all the levels of DLC are pretty long. Uh, though I'm pretty sure they did that on purpose. Yeah, there are only three missions in the DLC. They're definitely double the length of the um, of the base game levels, like. What's the longest left on the base game? Uh, probably either Terrace and the Bad? Oh yeah, that was a long one too. Uh, Terrace and the Bad, I think BFG, BFG Division. Uh, BFG was, Division though, that, that was that, was that Not the name? BFG, uh, it's called Mars, Mars Core. Mars yeah, 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 I think that one was kind of long too. And, uh, well, that's Arc because it's technically three levels in one. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, kind of. Uh, Terrace and the Bad, I'd say like Terrace and the Bad and uh, Mars Cole were probably like some of the longest levels in the game. Um, and uh, I'd say, like, Holt is definitely longer than both of those missions. Um, I mean, not Holt, uh, Blood Swamp. Oh, is, Blood Swamp is, is definitely by far the, the longest mission in the, in but, the entire game. I mean, because, I'm pretty sure this was on purpose, because there were only three missions within the game, or within the DLC, they wanted to stretch them out a little bit, you know, just to make sure you're getting like, a good bang for your buck. Yeah. Um, I would definitely say that I am very excited for the for the next DLC because who that cliffhanger without spoilers? Yeah, boy, <laughs> that cliffhanger was good. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was definitely interesting. Uh, though I, some people said that they kind of saw it coming. Um, I didn't. Admittedly. Well, if you read all the codex entries, you saw. I coming. did not read all. Of yeah, I read. I read at least like, videos. I hunted every single codex entry in that thing, and I was like, I will learn the lore of this DLC. Oh, and you know what? You know what bugs me? 
so in that IGN DLC, or IGN review of the DLC, oh, um, no. we don't want IGN DLC. <laughs> well, you know one of the dumb things that they said, and this is kind of going along the lines of codex ent entries in the game, mm -hmm. uh, they said, uh, you know, that they called the um, codex entries like boring and like tedious. And the thing I couldn't help but think of, and I don't let her brother also said the same thing, um, but the whole point of the whole point of the codex entries is so that there aren't people complaining about the fact that oh there aren't there aren't enough um, uh, there's too much story in the game uh, too little no no people complain they don't want people complaining that there's too much story in the game you know like like there are cutscenes and everything well, in the game you know what they so they set aside the story in codex entries so you're still getting a good portion of the story and understanding it but it's not interrupting the flow of the game. You know what they said about 2016? The developers were li literally like, they had the entire game finished, and then they went back and said, oh, we don't have a story. Yeah, that's... We should probably go add a story. <laughs> yeah, let's be honest. Doom has never been, like, known well no, for Do its Doom story. No, Doom is the classic run-in, shoot, beat the mess out of the enemy, congratulations, you saved the princess, and you're good. I mean, not to say that the story for Doom, for the new, for these new Doom games, aren't isn't interesting, especially since it connects back to the, uh, um, to the original games. Uh, I guess that's a spoiler. Huh? No, really, no, no. I mean, at this point, if you haven't played the game, I mean, game's been out for what a year now. Kind yeah, it's, it came out. Shoot, it no, it hasn't. Out it came out earlier this, this year. year. Jeez, <laughs> wow. <laughs> twenty twenty. What happened? <laughs> um. Uh, Sorry, on the topic of older games. So, there are some older games that need remakes. We already know that there are strong rumors of Mass Effect, the Mass Effect trilogy, getting a reboot. That would be fantastic. A uh, remake for, like, the new consoles. Like, apparently we were supposed to get news about it yesterday because yesterday was in seven day for Mass Effect. Um, I'm going to guess that's, like, the anniversary for No, it, in No, dude, in the Mass Effect universe, in seven. Y yes, what, what? I know. I know what that is. There's an actual in seven day. In yes, the Mass yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, dude, it's in seven day. Darn, how much? Because of how much I know about the game. That's, Mass Effect is like one of my favorite gaming trilogies. So like, oh, by the way, in case, in case it's not clear, um, this is the second topic that we're talking about right now. Ga games that need reboots. Yeah. Um, or what games sh deserve reboots? There have been like. rumors that uh, Jack and Daxter are supposed to get a remake, which I'm like, finally. Uh, sorry, finally, Jack and Daxter gets a reboot. Because I'm like, listen, I like Ratchet and Clank. I, I love the first game. It is one of my favorite PS2 games. But Jack 3 is probably my third favorite PS2 game. Only being beaten out by Shadow of the Colossus. And Which already got a reboot, and it fully deserved that reboot, too. Yeah, that was a fantastic reboot. And the second place one is Dragon Ball Z Tenkaichi 3. Fight me, best Dragon Ball game ever. Dragon Ball Z Budokai Tenkaichi 3. Budokai Tenkaichi 3. Right, there are versions of it. There's yes, already a Tenkaichi yes, 3. That's a different game. I know, I know. But point is, yeah, no, uh, I agree, Jack and Daxter. Like, Ratchet and Clank already got it, um, a reboot. And Crash got a reboot. Yeah, Crash got a reboot, and they're already coming out with sequel games for both of uh, both of those reboots. Yeah, Crash Four just came out. When? What? What? Did it come out already? It came out a few weeks ago. I Did think. it? Hold on. Look that up. Look it up quick. Um, while Josh is looking that up, um, personally, I want. Oh yeah, it came out October second. Wow. Oh yeah, there you go. Personally, I want a. What's it called? Dino Crisis? I think that's the name of the game. Dino Crisis. Dino Crisis Reboot. What the heck is Dino Crisis? I don't think I you don't know Dino Crisis? See, when you say Dino Crisis, my mind immediately goes to Turok, and I don't think that's the same thing. No, 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 no. Okay, so Dino Crisis was, it had this, like, one red-headed lady who she fought, like, dinosaurs that escaped in a lab or something like that. All I remember is, like, when I was younger, our dad used to play it all the time because we had cool games like that. We also had Quake 2, but we don't talk about that. <laughs> yeah, we also had Torak Evolution, but whatever. We uh, definitely don't talk about that incident. No, we don't. No, we shouldn't. 
We should, because that's the only dinosaur-related game that I know of when I think of. (laughs) See, the context, if you're missing context, uh, you see, when we were younger, we had Turok Evolution, which is one of my favorite games growing up. We played the mess out of that game. Um, But for one reason or another, uh, my brother suggested that we we sell it, (laughs) that we get rid of it. And to this day, I will never understand yeah, why. Yeah, we, we got a grand total, total of a dollar and 64 cents Keep in mind, it. keep in mind, we bought, we, we sold other games with it. So we sold it to GameStop. Um, to this day, I'll never understand why he decided to do that. And he knew darn well how much we all enjoyed playing that game. But no, I wanted new games. Oh, but I like the old games we were playing. Besides, that's not the point. Well, well, actually, it would be nice for Torak to get a reboot, a decent reboot. I don't think Torak's ever going to get it. Well, every time they try to reboot the game, they, try to they get make it the edgy. One, they make it like. Yeah, Torak has never taken itself too seriously. I mean, it's a game about um, basically Indians fighting mechanized dinosaurs when you really get down to it how serious can you really make that not very serious yeah like let me think what other games need a good reboot like and and when i say reboot i mean the good old-fashioned remake treatment like Like shadow colossus resident evil both those got the really good remake treatment demon souls too demon souls the demon souls i would say the number one choice and I know it already got a technical up- a remaster, Anamusha. I, Anamusha is one of those games where... Onimusha. O- Onimusha. What does that mean, anyway? I don't know what, what it means. Well, we're going to find out now. <laughs> it's one of those games where it was 100% a product of Probably its time. But in the same vein that... Resident Evil got a remake, so it's not that claustrophobic. Oh, hi, I'm stuck shooting in a small little box of these dogs, which can move much, fa- much faster than my character. It means Demon Warrior. Ah, Demon Warrior. Um, I think they could do the same with Onimusha. The thing is, and Onimusha. you'd be surprised, actually, uh, how few people know what uh, Onimusha is. Um, oh, no, I'm not surprised. I, and I 100% for surprised. those who don't know, Onimusha was a... Um, as an old PS2 game uh, that was very in the same vein as Resident Evil except okay let me put it this way think of like the original Resident Evil games um, but they take place in feudal Japan and instead of zombies you're fighting demons of a variety of demons and you are a samurai with several different magical weapons yeah, the origin for uh, Onimusha was actually that when they wanted to make a sequel to the original Resident Evil, and I believe this is correct, they came up with two concepts. One turned into Onimusha, the other turned into Devil May Cry. See, on Devil May Cry, it was more of they tried, they were making like a sequel to, to Resident Evil, but they, um, while making the game, you know how there's a juggling mechanic when you're shooting someone with a game, uh, with the guns in Devil May Cry, they saw that. That that was kind of like a glitch almost while they were developing it. And mm-hmm. from there, they thought, hey, you know what? That's actually kind of cool. We're going to make a whole game out of this. That's the sh- Yeah, with Onimusha, game. they wanted to make a, a version of the game uh, of Resident Evil in the literally feudal Japan. Um, and it simply turned into that instead of <laughs> a Resident Evil game. I think they... I can't. I, I don't remember for sure, so don't quote me on this. But uh, like they were trying to make like an older version, like like Nick said, uh, like it was going to be a, a Resident Evil game that took place in feudal Japan. Um, but for some reason, for one reason or another, they said no, this wouldn't make sense. Uh, it, it doesn't fit Resident Evil, so they just decided to make a game of it, a, a separate game of it, which I appreciate because you know what, Amusha um, is a pretty darn good game. I don't think it gets the respect for it, it deserves, especially since like it it's built off of like the original Resident Evils. It has like similar game mechanics as it, um, and it's it's just a good game. Uh, we're probably right now putting like pictures of it on screen if you're looking at this uh, right we now. We most certainly are. Okay, well, um, but you wanna know one game that I actually am really mad is getting a remake? Metal Gear Solid. Is it remake? They're doing it without Kojima. 
Like the original original. The original. Well, and he, my, my thing is, it's just like, what is Metal Gear? What is a man? What is a man? A miserable little pile of secrets. <laughs> All right, yeah, Metal Gear, not Castlevania. What is Metal Gear without Kojima? No, no, like, no. Kojima is Metal Gear. Exactly. You I'm don't... like, how do, you, how do you have the balls to kick this man out of the studio, languish for what? When, when Phantom Pain came out, 2015? Languish for five years. And then remake the man's game. Like, if I did that, like, if I wrote a book, and then these guys remade that book, rewrote the book again, I'd be like, dude, someone's paying me money. Well, they do have the right, I think he gave the right of Metal Gear to Sony, so. Uh, um, Konami. Konami. Um, and technically, they have the right to do that. But at the same time, first of all, they had to try to make a Metal Gear game without uh, Kojima. And what happened? We got Metal Gear Survive. Now, I haven't played the game myself, but I've seen the gameplay, and I've also heard so many other people there talk about it. There are easier it ways sucks. to commit suicide than to play that game. And the thing is, uh, it, um, it is a bit of a slap in the face of Kojima if they actually like, go through with making a reboot of it. Because, uh, like, that is his, for lack of a better word, that is his baby. That is his creation that he is That is his magnum opus, to be honest. That is his thing. His, his, as well, yeah, as, as Nick said, magnum opus. But on, on that whole topic, and they're also supposed to be making a Castlevania remake, um, there have been so many Castlevania it, games. K Konami has a history of just beating the mess out of the most popular developers. Um, think about it, the guy who was the head of Castlevania, he left and made, uh, what, what's it called? What, what's the name of that new series? Uh, the, the new, Bloodstain. Yeah, he left and made Bloodstain, which, excellent game, you should play. I um, appreciate the original Castlevania, definitely. Especially if, you, especially if you like Symphony of the Night, uh, Bloodstain 2 is basically Symphony of the Night. Um, wait, isn't that the name of it? Simple, simple, no, wait, shoot, what's the second plus name game called? I don't remember. I don't see, now we look stupid because <laughs> now we don't know the games that we're talking about. Oh, great. I just know it's Bloodstained 2. Bloodstained. Uh, I swear we do, we do extensive research of oh, this. Sure we do. Sure uh, we do. <laughs> oh, okay. It's called uh, Ritual of the Night. That's Ritual why I was of Simply the Night. Night, Night yeah, Ritual of the Night. Yeah, I was close. But yeah, it, like Konami has had a history of doing that, and now they're going back and remaking some of their games, like with Castlevania and Metal Gear. And I'm like, you're remaking the game without the heart of the game, right? Like, you know how you in Yu-Gi-Oh! It's like the heart of the cards. Um, you're, you're remaking it without the heart, without the bleeding core of the game. What made it good? It just feels kind of hollow to me, honestly. It it really does. Mm. It was, it's like if you were to make, try to make Resident Evil without the zombies. You know, the main thing that makes it Resident Evil Resident Evil is the zombies, but in this case... Wait, wasn't that just Resident Evil 6? You just had super hulking characters just beating the mess out of each other? Is that Resident Evil 6? Well, 7 is a biohazard. Hazard. Yeah, and Resident Evil 6... Yeah, Resident Evil 6 didn't do too well, if I'm right. Yeah, it sucked. Yeah, so... My point exactly. <laughs> but yeah, um, I really can't think of any other games that I, off the top of my head that I would say really need a remake. Um, I mean, I would a good few. I, although I would say, I would love to see. No, I got one that needs a remake. Okay. Or at least, if not a remake, at least a sequel with a few characters. Mortal Kombat, Shaolin Monks. Oh, that game. Actually, no. That I, I take it back. No, that one doesn't need a remake. That one needs a re, uh, a sequel, preferably. You know, the first one starred uh, Kung Lao and Liu Kang. The second one, which everyone agrees on, needs to star Sub Zero and Scorpion. That would be fantastic. And I don't think enough people know about Mortal Kombat Shaolin Monks. If you haven't played it, or if you haven't yeah, seen it, man. look it up, and I, I suggest you play it, because uh, it's not your traditional Mortal Kombat game, it is definitely not. It's more of like a, 
I want to say 3D beat em up. To a Pretty much, degree. it's a 3D beat em up. It's like you, you get you're playing as Kung Lao and Liu Kang throughout the game, and like you, you know, you're you're fighting characters, fighting enemies, and all that stuff, and you get experience as you that play, game and you get abilities and stuff. That game had so many Easter eggs. Like I remember when I first found out about the Molina. Easter egg, so you can actually fight Molina and you can uh, fight yeah. Kano. Like, you know the most hidden boss, Kano. Kano? No, no, that's no. You fight him throughout the game. Mm -hmm. uh, he's like near the end of the game, isn't he? Yeah, he's right at the end of the game. Um, and I, I forget specifically what you have to do for that, but Kano is right at the end of the game, right before you go fight uh, Shang Tsung. Kinta uh, Kinta what's his name? Kintaro. Kintaro. Is that his name? The forearm. Tiger looking. The forearm tiger looking guy. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's Tiger. And Shao on. Kahn. Um, he is like the most hidden boss because like you can find Melina if you just follow the hints on the screen. You know what, some of those Easter eggs, sorry to interrupt you, but some of those Easter eggs are very vague because you can also find Sonya in the game. And you want to know how they tell you to find Sonya? Every time, like you get small hints in the loading screens. They say, follow the rabbit. What the heck does that mean? Because I've never seen a rabbit in that game, and every time I'm looking, like, I don't know, I don't know where it is that they want me to look for this rabbit. There's like this one portion in the very beginning part of, um, you know, when you get to the living forest section. Yeah, yeah. Like you see like a small thing rustle in the bushes. They, if you were quick yeah, enough, you can yeah. see like I think that's the rabbit that they're talking about. But I don't know how to access it. I don't know how to interact with it. I don't know if that's the only time that you see it because I never see it after that. So, um, yeah. Point is, Shaolin Monks is a fantastic game, and I think it really at least deserves a sequel. And if you want to talk to any other person who has played the game or seen the game, they tell you the same thing. I would actually say, and this is a bit of an unpopular opinion, it, the first Infamous needs a remake. Simply because no, I agree with that. I hate Infamous 2 because it kind of like ruined Cole's character, the main character Cole. It, it ruined his character by giving him more like an ed, like. And, and no, before you say not that, I feel edgy, like you're about to say edgy, but not edgy, but giving him more of a oh hero complex. It gave him a hero complex when in the canonical ending to the first game, you end it as the bad guy. That's the canonical canonical ending in the first game. You, you, it's the bad ending in the first yeah, but game. The canonical ending in the second game is the good ending. Yeah, because you go from being a bad guy to being a good guy. What's the ending? What's the ending of the, the bad ending of the first one? Uh, it's pretty much the same as the, the other one, except you just, I think, brutally kill the main villain. I, I forget what like else you do, but essentially, yeah, the, the endings are pretty much the same. Um, it's just, yeah, the... Or at least a follow-up to, like, Second Son or something like that. That would be cool. But, yeah, the Infamous games are some of my favorite PS3 games. Uh, they were, like, they were like the launch titles for the PS3, I think. The Infamous, I mean. It was I know launch Second titles. Son was the, was the launch title for the PS4. Yeah. I definitely know that. I'm pretty darn sure the, the first Infamous was uh, the launch title for the... Uh, the PS3, so I mean, yeah, it makes sense. It'd be cool if there was an infamous coming out for the, uh, for the PS5, be the last one for PS5. But. Yeah, that'd be great. Too bad I'd never get it because PlayStation sucks. Fight me. Uh, <laughs> all right, we're not here to bring up controversial opinions. We're only here to talk about controversial opinions. <laughs> There's a difference. Yeah, speaking of controversial opinions, oh boy, I have a controversial one. Is Dragon Ball Super good? Our third topic. Now, this is where I, I have to make a clarification here. A lot of people in the last couple of years, since Dragon Ball Super has gone off air, have been saying that Dragon Ball Super isn't that good in a retrospective view. And personally, I have to disagree. Now, I, now, now in, in the view of this, you have the Battle of Gods, Frieza, Universe 6, Black, and uh, what do you call it? The, un the Tournament of Power. All five of those arcs. And going through each of those, I think we can really come down to a good decision of is it good or not. So let's start with Battle of Gods. Uh, Battle of Gods was a good start. No, no, no. no. 
To be fair, okay, not the movie, like the show. Oh yeah, the show, obviously. Okay, because uh, the show is the canon. Though the movie wasn't bad either. Um, but yeah, I think it was good. Uh, it was a good. I, it was a good way to introduce the um, the show. Uh, it was already done in the movie, so they didn't really have to change much. But uh, for the show, it was just um, it was a good way to introduce the show, introduce new characters, being Beerus and Beerus and Weiss, and uh, it was also a good idea of, of introducing a higher scale of power within the world of Dragon Ball, uh, which would be prevalent throughout the, pretty much the rest of the um, throughout the rest of Super. So. Battle of Gods, I thought it was good. Um, that was a good introduction. I agree. Movie. Animation aside, we don't, we're not talking okay. about that. We're for, talking about story, not animation. For the sake, of, for, the, for the sake of this conversation, and for anyone who cares about this stuff, we're just gonna ignore the conversation of animation. We know darn well that when the show originally came out, initially came out, it the animation was, bad. was not exactly <laughs> top notch. They fixed it in the dub when, when the dub came out, partially. But it was better on the Blu-ray when the Blu-ray came yeah, out. Obviously, because it's Blu-ray, but still. Um, so we're just gonna set aside the whole animation topic for now. We're just yeah. talking about the each saga as a whole. Was it good or not? I agree. Battle of Gods, not bad. Um, I think the biggest issue with Battle of Gods is that it was so short, and that also goes on with the Freezer saga. Although the Freezer saga, saga has more issues going well, on. Well, Battle of Gods, like I said before, was already, it was kind of already hashed out in the movie, so I didn't think, so well, I, I mean, they, they were probably my, like, my, well, we've already done this before, we know this song. Well, my issue is, if you go by the order of the sagas, every saga got longer, but the problem is the first two, it was like 20 episodes, I think, I think, probably 20. Um, now, Frieza, here's my thing. I've always enjoyed Frieza as a villain. Cell has always been my favorite villain, discounting Black and Broly. But I feel like I feel like with Frieza, it comes down to this: Do you truly believe that Frieza never trained a day in his life, and then in six months he's considered a god, little god tier character? When you think about it, he, can, he literally is up in God in God tier he, echelon. He's deals, deal, he's matching people who fight with literal God energy. So, yeah, when you think about it, I mean, it, he, at that point, he's he's literally strong enough to beat every single Supreme Kai. Well, he was strong enough to beat the majority of the Supreme Kai. Like hmm? the Supreme Kai, um, well, regular just, Supreme no, no, Kai, remember? he said that he was about the strength of Frieza and the Buzaki. He did no, 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 no. He said he could have beaten Frieza. Yeah, so he was about the strength of Frieza, maybe a bit stronger, mm. like probably about the strength of regular Super Saiyan. But I would say he's uh, probably close. And admittedly, the thought of like Frieza training for six months and then suddenly getting this massive what do they call it, Zenkai boost? I think. No, Zenkai boost is only for the Saiyans. That's okay. just a card training. Well, <laughs> within six months, like okay. It's believable that his race is just naturally strong. It makes sense because... No, 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 it's not even that his race is naturally strong. It's that his family specifically is a mutant, like, breed. It's a mutant strain. Well, I mean, um, when you think about, like, Saiyans, like, if you compare Saiyans to humans, Saiyans are significantly stronger than humans, naturally. Um, so, and with training, they can get significantly stronger, uh, stronger than that. So it's believable that they can be that Frieza is naturally naturally that strong, and you know he probably didn't train. And plus, his race literally has levels of power that they can go through and get even stronger. So realistically, when you think about it, he probably didn't need to train because oh, what I can't be this person? Okay, let me just transform, get him even stronger. What I can't be him with this form? Okay, let me just transform, get him even stronger. Well, you strong. forget Frieza. That's basically, what he did all of Frieza's Frieza transformations were to suppress his power, not to. Get not because remember true the the bald alien free, bald alien white short freezer that's that's his true form yeah yeah that's his true form I know and then he gets all golden and an Emmy <laughs> <laughs> can you imagine that like that's the that's the anime Emmy it's like it's a golden <laughs> freezer <laughs> but 
I mean, Golden Fleece of Saga wasn't bad. Again, I think the biggest issue is just the belief that Frieza literally never trained a day in his life. Although, now, with the current Moro Saga going on, that's a lot more believable considering how strong Moro is without training. We're, we're not gonna we're not gonna talk about that because right now that's manga stuff, and for the sake of those who only watch the anime, yeah, like some like losers, myself, um, and many of uh, the other people who may or may not be watching this right now or listening to this right now. Um, yeah, the anime uh, hasn't reached that stuff yet, so. But one of the other things that I think made the Frieza Saga um, not the best, well, one of the best things and I think the worst things about the Frieza Saga, about the Frieza Saga for Super was, one, the battle between all the Z fighters and Frieza's army. I thought that was one of the better parts of it. Um, two, it was the first sign of Super doing my boy Gohan dirty. <laughs> they just annihilated him in that. Like, all right, let's be honest. Gohan's probably the third strongest character within all of Go uh, within all of Dragon Ball, at least uh, within the Z Fighters. Uh, seventeen. Uh, debatable. Uh, that's not debatable. Seventeen is stronger. De debatable. But point is, it was the first time. At least in the anime, he's stronger. It was the first time they did my boy Gohan dirty by basically making him get annihilated by. Uh, they gave in this the man glasses and a jumpsuit. In, yeah, <laughs> in the in the in the show, I think I don't think he even fought Frieza. He just he no, he got annihilated by Ginyu, didn't he? When he took over the other guy's body. I think it's been a while since I've seen that uh, that particular. Yeah, saga. it's been a while for me to see it. It's, it's been a while since I've seen it too. But the point is, boy, Gohan got his butt kicked. And keep in mind, Gohan is supposed to be one of the strongest. He's supposed to be one of the strongest. People in the whole seventh universe, seventh universe. When you really think about it, like yeah. honestly, think about it. He's supposed to be one of the strongest people in the, the entirety of the seventh and universe. And then he gets backhanded by Frieza. Pretty much, or even Frieza's goons. And now I, I respect what they did with Gohan to a certain degree because you know what? He is not a fighter. He wants to live an ordinary life. This is at least as much of an ordinary life as he can. And I respect that because you know not. Not everyone can be, you know, a Goku or a Vegeta who's just constantly looking for the next fight. I respect that. But you also have to respect the thought of Gohan is one, literally one of the strongest beings in that in that entire universe. Yeah. Respect yeah. that and know it and, and at least work towards it. And they do, they I think they do realize that as the, as the thing goes, as, as the anime goes, they're like, okay, Gohan is supposed to be one of the strongest characters, so... Let's train him back up and make him an actual character. But even when you get to the Tournament of Power, which we'll probably talk about, um, he still wasn't the best in that. Like, he could have been better. Now, okay, so for Tournament of Power, we'll have to talk about both the anime and the manga because they did things different in certain cases. And some things I agree with in the manga more than the anime. But let's get on to Universe 6, perhaps the least memorable of all of the arcs. No. Like it's memorable for one particular part. It's memorable only for the hit fight. The hit versus Goku fight. You're done right. But, 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 but. That, 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 that's, go back, go back. The Universe 6 arc did a lot of good things in expanding the Dragon Ball lore, which is something that hadn't been done, again, since the Boo arc. Um, at least getting giant expanses of Dragon Ball lore, because... Yes, Battle of Gods expanded to the God level. I mean, Battle of Gods kind of just opened the door for the idea, and then Universe, Universe Six, 6 expanded upon yeah. it. But I think if we're being fair, aside from the hit fight and the introduction of Champa and Vados, I let, let me let me put this way: I started watching Dragon Ball Super at the middle of the Universe 6 arc, because that's when I first found out that Dragon Ball Super was happening, because, you know, at that time I was in college, and yeah, yada, 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 a lot still of stuff. Still in college. Yeah, still in college. Um, but I was not really interested in the Universe 6 tournament, because, like, the only real... The, the, my favorite fight in, that entire, in the entire Universe 6 arc was... Vegeta versus Magetta. Was that his name? Magetta? Yeah. Magetta. Simply because, A, I'm a Vegeta fan. Fight me. I, I like Vegeta. You really do. But, 
that was the only fight where it actually seemed like there were high stakes because with the hit fight the moment goku stepped in and he figured out how to beat hit it was just like oh here we go goku's gonna win again and i don't mean to be a goku hater goku's the main character it's what happens the main character shows up things happen events happen plot moves on but so hold on i disagree with that i know i'm gonna try to you mid thought but like uh one uh, if you forgot, Goku went in that uh, went in the tournament earlier in the tournament. He, fought, he was going to fight Frost, but Frost cheated, and you were you know you probably would have thought, okay, yeah, Goku's gonna wipe the floor with him if he's just like freezer. But no, he lost. Yeah, of course it was because Frost cheated, but still it was like. Yeah, but to me it was the Universe Six arc was just predictable. Because it, it there wasn't no. It, it was just a standard tournament. There was nothing really. Well, I mean, that's all. When you really get down well, I mean, to there it, there weren't any big what like Dragon Ball think, is. think of like King and Asher. The entire show is a tournament. no, no. I'm, <laughs> I'm saying there were some upsets in King and Asher, but for that, the only real upset was Goku getting knocked out in the first round and then him getting back in. But after that, it was just like moments you find out what far stage. You're like, oh, so it's just evil yeah, Freezer. But like. Freezer, uh, Freezer, uh, uh, Dragon Ball, it, it, it always has slightly been kind of predictable when you, true, when you get true. down it, to it. That, Dragon Ball's not Dragon Ball's not the kind of guy, it, it's not, I hate to compare two shonens here, but it's not like, say, Naruto. Naruto tends to throw curveballs from time to time, you know, it really gets deep into like character depth, uh, character development and all that. Dragon um, Ball's never For Dragon that. Ball, for as much love as, love as I get, for as much love as I give Dragon Ball, it's not that. You know, honestly, majority of the time, uh, what people watch Dragon Ball for is strictly the for the for the fights and the power fantasy. Mm -hmm. Because who doesn't love watching two massively powered characters screaming at each other as they're charging up and causing giant explosions everywhere they go? Yeah, a couple of brawlic guys beating the mess out of each other. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's my thing. I think Universe Six, great lore, excellent story building. And world building and story building. Not really that inventive. Hmm. Now we get onto the most controversial arc. Possibly, well, it is my favorite arc within all of Super. Same. We've got the uh, Goku Black, the arc. Goku Black arc, or the Future Trunk arc, Trunk arc, which has, whichever you want to. Just gonna call it Goku Black for. for now, sure personally, is. discounting Broly as Broly will always be my number one Dragon Ball villain. Classic role. Goku Black is my favorite film. And that's simply because he is so much the opposite of Goku while still being an evil Goku. And I think it is the most well executed arc because Dragon Ball has never been dark. Well, but anytime, that arc was dark. Anytime that involves trunks, it always gets kind of dark. And I think that's. People tend to have a problem with the Goku Black arc because they just, sometimes they see it as, oh, well, it's Future Trunks again. They're just rehashing Future Trunks. And the ending. The, the ending. Yeah, the ending. We'll get to the ending. But, like, pe people just, like, see it as, like, oh, they're just rehashing Future Trunks. Oh, they're just using him for to make the, um, the series dark again. Which I can slightly see some some validity, validity behind that. But, but in their defense, in their defense, I said some validity. There's some validity there. In their defense, Trunks is the only dark section in all of Dragon Ball. I mean, oh if God. you've ever watched the Trunks movie, the entire thing is basically Terminator. Kind of, yeah. Two. <laughs> it, it is a dark. It is a grim dark. It, I, yeah, grim dark. It's a grim dark world yeah, it's that a dark, Trunks lives in. It's literally a darker version of what Dragon Ball sh could be. And the funny thing is, um, Tr Trunks' timeline, and not to get into timey-wimey stuff, because we all hate time stuff, um, Trunks' timeline's the base timeline. He is from the original Dragon Ball timeline. I mean, when you really get into it, yeah. Yeah, it, he is! It only changed because, because he went he back, went in, back time. in time. Yeah. And he really didn't even go back in time. He created a separate universe, which that's kind of completely weird time, stuff. Time, time stuff, uh, more stuff that we can get into. But let's talk about the main thing of 
the Goku Black arc, which is Goku Black, which I think excellent. He's villain. He's a fantastic villain, and my thing, my, one of my biggest things about him is he is basically the one, one the one villain who won. Oh, one hundred percent. He won, and and like he 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 accomplished his goal. He did everything. Like, okay, you've got Frieza tried to take over the universe, become immortal. Fail. Fail. Cell tried to at the very least destroy Earth. Fail. You got um Boo. Boo was just Boo also Boo Boo also tried to destroy the universe. Fail. Came close though. I was gonna say came close. He did end up destroying almost all life on Earth. Um, he came close. No, he did destroy all life on Earth. Right, well, he blew up the planet, Josh. I don't think there's right, any life on Earth if yeah. the planet's gone. Okay, well, he came close. He really... It, Boo came close. But he failed in the end. Um, you got... If you want to go into GT, um, you got... Whoa, uh, whoa there. Whoa, whoa. I just heard someone scream that GT's not canon. <laughs> well, you've got GT and all those villains, and the only one who came close in any of those was Baby. And um, he still failed too. But then you get to Goku Black, and he ended up destroying. Until he got to Earth, he destroyed every single universe. He destroyed all the universes. He killed all the gods. He's killed every single person. He Earth was basically his last stop in Universe Seven before he basically destroyed all life, mm -hmm. all mortal life anyway. And he 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 by the end of the mo of the saga. He he won practically. The only reason he destroyed Trunks' timeline. Everything that lived in that timeline was dead, aside from those who had survived the survived fighting him, which was Goku, Vegeta, Trunks, and Bulma. Yeah, that that was literally. Yeah. And and May. My my my. That was okay. my and my. The, they were practically the only people who lived. Through and, and the thing I like about Goku Black is. He's enjoying it. Like, it, it's not like Frieza, where Frieza's just like, oh, I'm evil for the sake of being evil. Yeah. It's not like Cell, where Cell was at least redeemable in the fact that he wasn't purely evil. He just wanted to be the best, and the best being in existence. He's not pure chaos like Boo. He's not greedy and lazy like Beerus. Uh, he's not even a, like, hitman for hire who only focuses on getting the job done like Hit. Goku Black solely wanted a single goal, and he got it. Which also brings up the question of, why didn't he just wish the entire... Yeah, I know, I was thinking that yeah. too. What, he used the Dragon Ball Super... So he used the Super Dragon Balls to make himself immortal. He could have used the Super Dragon Balls well, to... Well, Zamasu did that, not Black. Yeah, Zamasu did. Zamasu used the Super Dragon Balls to make himself immortal. Why didn't he just use the Super Dragon Balls to say, okay, I want to get rid of all mortal life in this year, in this universe, no, not even in this universe, in all of reality, because the Super Dragon Balls can make any wish, according to the gods, anyway, from what they said, it can make any wish happen. Although thinking about it, wouldn't that get rid of Goku Black because he's still mortal? That was the whole reason why they defused in the uh, anime. Well, they didn't defuse what, uh, what like they the fusion started. Yeah, started to be great because it was like a god fusing with a mortal. Uh, well, anyway, yeah. the the biggest controversy here, controversy here, is the ending. Now, I think if they had just left it at the point, look, Trunks bisects Zamasu, merged Zamasu, it would have been good. It was a good ending. Trunks used the power of the people to wipe out everything. Final um, friendship. Which was a bit of a cop out, but you know. Yeah, well, it's right. Well, um, it would have been good. But no. This man had to make himself immortal and merge with the freaking fabric of the universe and then say, ha, got him, and just wipe out existence. I mean, it would make sense when you think about it because, okay, so. Goku, Trunks somehow found a way to kill an immortal being whose body was could not be right. destroyed, but Trunks found a way. Kind of a, kind, kind of a, um, doesn't really make sense when you really get down to it. A bit of a plot hole there, but he found a way to destroy an immortal being. He's immortal, so even if he did find a way to destroy his body, it wouldn't last. It makes sense. 
he would still live on, though how he could use it with like the fabric of reality is beyond me, but it kind of makes sense. Yeah. I, overall, I don't hate the black arc. Again, I, I really know. like it. It's I, my favorite arc in Super. I think it, like, next to the Cell arc, is my favorite arc in all of Dragon Ball. It's the darkest arc in all of Super, and probably in all of Dragon Ball, when you really get down to it. Currently. Currently, I don't know about what's going on in the manga, but right yeah. now, it's probably the darkest arc in all of Dragon Ball, and um, it's... It, 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 and it has a legitimate... Yeah, I know I was just talking about the fact that Dragon Ball doesn't exactly have a lot of character development. But the Black Arc is one of the few shows, the f- few arcs that does actually have character development. Trunks, um, with Trunks, with Black himself. With Vegeta, yeah, you definitely yeah, feel Vegeta. a lot in Vegeta. Yeah, it's just... It, it, it had... Uh, the, the Black Arc, the way I could sum it up is it had a lot of depth to it, which I really appreciate. It was, it was a big... It was a good change-up for Dragon Ball. Wait, 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 do you hear that? Dude, that's the sound of an elephant in the room. It's called the Tournament of Power. <laughs> yeah, this beast. Okay, so this is the final arc in Dragon Ball Super, and I had, and we have to split this into the manga and the anime simply because certain events happen differently in both, and they really change how good it is. Well, certain events also changed in the manga of the Black Arc as well. Well, that was mainly in the ending, though. Yeah, but but with with the the fight with Vegito and... uh, Yeah, but with the Tournament of Power, though, it's like there are key points that are completely different. Like, in the manga, you have Master Roshi versus Jiren, and Master Roshi shows that he has some level of Ultra Instinct, which, again, as much as people hate it, I say it makes sense. Master Master Roshi is the oldest living being on Earth. He has had sheer decades of mastery and it's something that old master Oshi in Dragon Ball once said was it Dragon Ball? it might have been Z I don't remember what it is but it was basically Roshi had said that all of you guys use your power levels and these cool energy techniques and stuff like that but you forgot but you forget the basics yeah but Roshi you know sometimes I don't think he is he doesn't get the respect um that he probably deserves because he's, you know, he's technically, when you really get down to it, he's no pervert. <laughs> but the thing is, Roshi had never stopped training, though. No, never. Like, Roshi has always been training, and even more so than Tien, and that's another thing that I also wanted to point out. I feel like with Tien, he should be a lot more powerful than he is, especially considering that Krillin is more powerful than Tien. Um, and yes, that is canon. Krillin is more powerful than Tien. Tien is the second weakest member of the third weakest. Well, I mean, Krillin was the first one out for the universe. Seven. Yeah, but he did it to save a team, though. I'd still think he probably would have been kicked out. And, I mean, and think, Tien was the next one out, wasn't he? Tien only did that. He self-sacrificed himself to knock out the laser guy. Oh, yeah, yeah, he did. But anyway, so I think with the Tournament of Power, if you break it up into the three main different segments, the two main, I should say, the two main big segments, Roshi versus Jiren in the manga, and then Gohan versus Keifla in the manga versus Goku, uh, Ultra Instinct Omen Goku versus um, Keifla in the anime. Let me, and let I think that's the that part right there is the biggest difference. My biggest thing. Let's say, if, if we're talking about, like, Goku versus Kefla, um... Unnecessary. It was, a, it was a good fight. I liked watching it, and let me just say, that the coming, ending coming high. part of that... <laughs> I don't know if we're, gonna, if we're showing, like, a scene of it right now on screen or not. We probably will. Maybe not. I don't know. But the ending scene where he literally uses the Kamehameha, the charging Kamehameha, the skate on her beam until finally a blaster, that was one of the best parts of the entire arc. Okay, so we had some technical issues there, so <laughs> let's get back on track. Um, Which is going to take it from uh, when we were talking about the fantastic scene of when Goku um, skated on Kefla's beam and blasted her out of the ring. Yeah, like, that's epic, but Gohan versus Kefla in the manga, I think it, it does two things. 
it really establishes how much of a capable fighter Gohan is, but it also further establishes just how weak individually Kale and uh, Khalifa were. Yeah, to be honest, in the show, as cool, like I said, as cool of a fight as Kefla and versus Goku was, it was unneeded because there's no way Kefla was so strong that she needed Ultra Instinct to knock her out. Even if it's in Omen form. Yes. It, it And again, it's where I say Gohan really got his moment to shine in the manga because the way he got taken out by Dispo and uh, how he took Dispo out with Frieza in the anime kind of really just makes it look like, oh, Gohan did absolutely nothing in the tournament and eliminated one guy. Yeah, to be honest, all the characters in the tournament, or at least almost all of them, had their time to shine. Like Definitely Goku, Vegeta, Frieza. Uh, Even 17 and 18 had. Yeah, 17 and 18 had their time to shine. But the two, oh, Krillin and Tien as well, had their time to shine. They literally, some of them literally had their own episodes where a lot of it was mainly focused on them. But the two who got probably the least amount of time was Gohan and Piccolo. And even Piccolo, I think, had a little bit more time than Gohan. Like, they, in, just in the anime, they just didn't take the time to, like, really show Gohan a lot. Yeah, it sucks, man. Like, and that's why I think... Now, I, I'll be the first person to say, do I agree in saying that the Tournament of Power was a lot of wasted time with good segments? Yes. Do I think the Tournament of Power was bad? No. I just think the manga handled it better than the anime did. Admittedly, the Tournament of Power did kind of chug along midway through because there are a lot of, I'd like to say, kind of somewhat filler episodes where like nothing really in particular happened, nothing big anyway. And they, I think they just did that to kind of just pan out the time of the, of the, uh, of the tournament. Yeah, it really did seem like even those episodes had like the 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 the, the like animation quality went down on those. Like legit, like a lot of the uh, episodes that involved what was the universe? What number universe was it with the um with the girls? Um, four, four. Wait, wait, no, four. Was four the mouse? Four is the mouse. Might have been two. Uh, I don't know. Four the the one with, that looked like it had like uh, an Egyptian for the um for their god. The Sailor Moon universe. Basically. Yeah, the Sailor Moon universe. First of all, they were like some of my least favorite characters in the entire tournament. Mm -hmm. They really got annoying. Um, and a lot of the episodes that really involved them oftentimes kind of just were not that important. Exactly. Kind of just chugged on. Um, but also, speaking of animation, the thing that you mentioned before, while the Tournament of Power may have chugged on a lot, if there's one thing that they did fantastic in the Turn of the Power, those few episodes where they just went all out on the animation. The final episode, Goku, Jiren, Frieza, 17. I have seen very few scenes in anime that were as beautifully animated as that scene. That scene, uh, the first fight with Goku versus um, Jiren, which also kind of broke the internet for a small bit. It broke Crunchyroll. It was, yeah, I think, I think there were, I think, wasn't there an issue? Like, there were so many people watching on, mm -hmm. on Crunchyroll. So, we had a visit by uh, Diavolo and King Crimson. Yeah, uh, so, uh, we gained the information that uh, recording a podcast is, um, it's kind of hard, especially when you have outdated equipment. Yeah, technical S issues arise. So, um, so we're gonna round out this conversation in a very simple fashion. We're going to rank all five arcs of DBS from one to ten on how thick good we each think they are. So, Battle of Gods. Um, I give it a, I give it an eight out of ten. This is a solid start to Super. Rock. I say seven out of ten. Good. Has its issues. Uh, Freeze is high. <sighs> Seven out of ten again. Not bad. I just think some things from a lore perspective are a little problematic. Uh, I, I, yeah, I give it a seven out of ten too. It wasn't as good as Battle of the Gods, but it was also built up off of this the movie as well. So there wasn't too much that they could have gotten wrong with the movie or with the show counterpart. Universe six. 
Uh, you know, I give that one a. I'd like to give that one a six out of ten. It wasn't the best, and it, but it did lead the way to grander things within this series. Um, because you know, it opened the way to the several different universes. You know, Vitals and Chapa, and all that. And uh, also, the Hit versus Goku fight was like the best thing of that. Four out of ten for everything you said. I feel like those are positive things, but <laughs> all right. I, I just feel like it's a little lacking. It's great from a lore perspective, but again, I just think it was too predictable. And it 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 had potential, and that potential turned into the, on the universe, the tournament of power. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, honestly, when you really get down to it, the, the Universe 6 arc was basically just a giant door that kind of just made its way to the Universe 6 arc. Because, or, I mean, not, the, the tournament of power, because I was just... It brought in the idea of that and kind of just broke with it. But anyway, um, so Goku Black Arc. 9 out of 10. I agree. And probably for the exact same reasons you think it's 9 out of 10. Goku Black is excellent. Every story beat is excellent. The only downside is, again, the ending. And Honestly, I don't even think the ending is that bad. That's it. And even with Goku acting like an idiot, I think that's very much in character for Goku. Sorry, very quick now. If there's one thing I don't like about Dragon Ball Super is they kind of made Goku an idiot, and I'm, I never liked that about Super. Is is Goku a bit of an idiot? Technically, yes, because he's never had a formal education. But I don't know. He seemed smarter in Z than he did. I, so. I always said that it draw, is that Super made him more akin to the manga version of Goku, who was more of like a backwards heck to put it that way <laughs> but on to the big one tournament of power you anime know, version i want to put that as a the thing is there were really good parts of the tournament of power really really good parts of the tournament of power but then there were really you know kind of you know i'm not gonna say they were bad but you know they, they were good they were they were okay uh so it's hard to give this one a solid rank i kind of want Oh, well, when hard, was, for, hard for you? 7 out of 10. When it was good, <laughs> when it for the good parts, it was like a, it was a 9. Solid 9. Like, the, again, the Goku vs. Jiren fight, fantastic. It was 9. It was 9 out of 10. Like, the final fight between Goku, Jiren, Frieza, and 17. Well, that day is a 10 out of 10. 10 out of 10. Uh, Kefla vs. Goku, that was a 9, 8, somewhere within that. Um... But then you have the more slower, chuggy, chuggier parts, and then I give that like a 7, 7 out of 10. So, I don't know, somewhere between like a 7 and 9 out of 10. 7 to, seven to 10 out of 10, I give it. And Dragon Ball Super as a whole. Dragon Ball Super as a whole? I mean, it had its, you know, it, it had its parts that I thought were really good. Um, I give it a 7 out of 10. As a total, yeah, 7 out of 10, that seems solid. I'll have to agree, 7 out of 10, because my thing is, all of the bad parts of Dragon Ball Super are really outdone by just how iconic the good parts have become. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way to put it. And I think, yeah, is Dragon Ball Super as good as Z? No. I, I, I will not say it is. Well, some parts are, some parts are. But I will say that if I'm pitting it up against GT... And against Dragon Ball Heroes? Alright, you know what? <laughs> I'm definitely picking Super over that. That's a different conversation, but I think GT doesn't it gets a bad rap. Were there yeah. bad parts for GT? But yes, but there that's, were also a, good that's parts. a conversation for another day. Yeah, it's definitely a conversation for another day. Alright, so, so we're gonna wrap this up. That's the end of episode one of the game podcast. Yeah, remember it. Uh, Live it, here. love it, remember it, and we'll be here we'll it. probably in a couple weeks with another upload. Uh, possibly. I uh, hope you all enjoy it. Um, please, uh, we appreciate uh, you telling anyone who you think might enjoy this podcast. Because, uh, you know what, uh, this is our first episode. We don't know how popular this is going to get. We're hoping it gets really popular, but uh, you yeah. can't do that without uh, a good fan base. So, Well, okay. This has been your host, I'm Nick. And I'm Josh. And we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in.